<laughs> My name is Jenna Rodriguez. Thank um, you, Jenna. And I, I work work at Series Imaging. Series Imaging, how exotic mm-hmm. is that? <laughs> and then you've well, even uh, worked oh, surveilling uh, grape uh, implantations everywhere and. What do you do? Talk to us a little bit about what you do or what you're interested in, in terms of agriculture and other such things. Sure. Well, I'll tell you what. I love the name, too. Our, our founder named it after the Roman goddess of, um, of agriculture. So that's where Ceres comes from. Yes. And we did actually start out as a drone company. I heard you uh, alluding to drones a little bit and yes. so that's where we started out and what we wanted to do was that with with remote sensing you want to fly when the sun's directly overhead and so you have a very small window you know within about two hours of solar noon when that when that sun angle is directly overhead that you want to capture your imagery so that you get very consistent readings from the sunlight mm-hmm. and With drones, you know, if you're covering a lot of different blocks and crops in different areas of a region um, or larger blocks, then, you know, as the sun passes, your your readings from that image are going to change. So we wanted to keep research-grade imagery, um, but bring it down to a more affordable cost for our growers and also capture that imagery really quick when the sun's overhead and We figured out how to do that with with airplanes. That's exciting. I'm a big sky pilot. I really am. Uh, And any of us that are in the garden, really, we're aerially surveilling our row crops, even if they're vegetables, and you can see all kinds of weird stuff. But on a larger scale, there are issues that happen underground that could be like a area that doesn't produce well or that is too wet or dry or what have you talk about some of that kind of work that you've done yeah we so i'll walk it back a little bit one of the things that makes us unique about what we do is we don't just capture the images but we are imagery as a service where we will put our interpretations of the images in the in your computer, you know, on your desktop or on your mobile device, helping walk you through what patterns we're seeing that can be related to, you know, what's going on in the soil, what's going on from, you know, the high, the previous hydrologic landscape that we're seeing kind of resonate through those crops. You know, we see stream beds and gravelly streaks that show high water stress when that water is just draining um, in, a, in any sort of crop. And so to help our users understand that, we'll put in those interpret, you know, we'll interpret the imagery uh, for them and help them understand what they're seeing. As for example, even at my place, it's a prehistoric site, there are bedrocks everywhere. And so that means they're covered with soil and decomposing material. That means that you go down to this certain point, and there's a floodplain, really, based on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're seeing that visually and interpreting it for your client that he understands his underground as well as his upper ground. Yeah. So how we do that is we put different lenses on our sensors that are looking at very specific light wavelengths and what's really cool about these narrow bands of light is that you can correlate those light wavelengths by doing certain calculations and correlate them to water uptake patterns or the amount of chlorophyll in the leaves related to your nitrogen content and the you know uh, fertility of your crop or the photosynthetic biomass So you can look at different layers of these algorithms because obviously there's a lot of research behind this. So the everyday person wouldn't be able to download an image, learn how to open it up, do these rigorous calculations, and then interpret it from there. So we take all of that work out of it and provide those images for you based on your biomass or your chlorophyll or your water stress. And by comparing those layers against each other, then you can look at, you know, is my 
are my tomatoes stressed because there's a change in soil and there's a sandy area where there's a lot of water being lost to deep water percolation and you know it's getting stressed in one area with that sandy area but then once it gets to more clayey soils then the tomatoes aren't as stressed um so by looking at that we can start figuring out is this an irrigation problem is this related to my soil changes is this related to my you know uh, fertility or, or for my composting and nutrient management Right. It depends on the crop, how far they are going to go down to look for whatever they need. And are they perennial or annual, what have you? I mean, or yeah. biannual or whatever, uh, temporary perennial, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And that's, that's one of, there's a couple of different important things about capturing images. And this goes for whether you're using a drone or an airplane or a satellite. And right. that's looking at the spectral resolution so that's what we talked about the light spectra that is correlated that you can use for looking at different types of health in your crop so the light the spectral resolution but then there's also the temporal resolution that's really important so like you're saying with different crop types it's important to capture those images at specific times because there's different growing seasons for different crops Exactly. And then uh, furthermore, you're apparently interpreting all these different, I'm going to call them aerial surveillances, coming from different sources to give a more uh, complete picture. Is that right? Yep, yep, that's exactly right. I mean, and that's something that if one of us decided to do this on our own, we would spend years trying to figure all these different things out. Just like I am with my cell phone. <laughs> yeah, and you know, we the images are readily accessible on your cell phone, so it's it's really not that far off. Gee, that's scary. Well, anyway, you know, I mean, it'll take all the equation of humans out of agriculture. I think that the ant people would be interested in that. They don't like the way all these people that have a vagus nerve, they run around and they get so excited about things. They like things a little more orderly and quiet, you know. Everybody has their own field, you know. One thing that I really do like about remote sensing, and I've, I've been working with imagery for the last decade or so, and the growers that we work with, you know, remote sensing isn't a panacea. It's not going to be a cure-all to where you can sit from an office and have everything automated and never go walk out. But why people like this is that the, our customers are people that like to get out into their, their field but they just need to know where should I go. And with all the things going on, they need to be more efficient about where they want to go and check things out and make, you know, more robust decisions about how to fix things. So the imagery really helps them on getting out in the field, but just going to the right spot. Nothing like the right spot. (laughs) Well, that's amazing. Now tell me, uh, where are you going to be presenting uh, and if there are people in the audience, they're free to call in at 265-9555 and ask questions of our wonderful Jenna to find out uh, maybe things that they don't feel we've covered. And uh, But aren't you going to be speaking at something that is happening in February, which incidentally ushers in the year of the pig? And in Chinese uh, astrology, and we're coming into that wonderful time of year, which is also in the Celtic uh, knot of uh, cross quarters, the Feast of Light. And um, so it's like new beginnings, and it can be new beginnings in your garden or what have you. Uh, So what I'm wondering is, are there certain issues uh, about this coming event that you can tell us, like, when you're going to speak. Yep, I and will where? be there. And where. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's called the Ag Tech 19 Micro Conference. Micro. So I will be, conference. yeah, micro conference. And yep. why do they say that, just for the heck of it? Is it because it's technology in, involved or nothing more than microorganisms? Um, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm sure that there's probably, you know, some some dual purposes at play. So I'm not sure where the micro comes from, but I will be there. 
on February 7th, and I believe it's uh, the Ag Tech 19 micro conference on February 7th from 1 to 6 p.m. And I believe it. Yeah, I think it's at, but she knows, uh, Sierra Nevada's Junior College. Yeah, yep, that's right. Is it the one in uh, Grass Valley? Um, I'm not sure. I was thinking about a city, but maybe it's Grass Valley. Um, it's, and it says the my my flyer of where I'm supposed to be is the Sierra College multi-purpose room. Very good. And is this an association with the Food and Agriculture Conference that is also going on at the same time? And this is just a, a side thing, I think, of this, or another part of it. You see what I mean? Like a spinoff. Maybe it's a spinoff for I th- the tech I th- people. I think it's wonderful. So there's a lot of people today that have uh, technology uh, <clears throat> equipment, and they're wondering maybe what to do if they've got a small farm. Can you relate to a small farm with your kind of information and the work that you do? Sure. So we have a very large breadth of growers that we work with. They range from some 20 acre growers to, you know, 20,000 acre growers. So there's a very, um, there's applications for capturing imagery for any sort of size and commodity. And so we, our imagery, the pixels that you're looking at are about 20 centimeter in resolution. And when we, so that with 20 centimeters, you can get lots of pixels for, you know, any any size grower. Um, so with smaller growers, you know, it is it is a little bit more challenging because typically, if if we're talking small growers, you know, 20 acres, it's very easy for you to cover the ground and see what's going on. Yeah. Um, so you might not need as many flights maybe just one or two flights to help you get a better idea of how uniform everything is. Or if you really do have a a problem block that you're just, you've been working on it for a long time and you just really don't know what's going on there. Right. Something underground, maybe we don't know. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So if you're just really, um, just really can't figure out what's going on and you think that some imagery might give you, might shed some new light on it, right? <laughs> um, that's that's you... <laughs> interesting. <laughs> well, I'm I, yeah, I'm no. a firm believer in staying on top of the ground. Masanobu Fukuoka-san said that. He said, you know, stay on top of the ground, be happy, dance, play. But underground is a vast, vast, you know, the deeper you dig, the darker it gets. But with this kind of imagery, you're obviously looking underground without going underground. And since the whole Pacific Rim is nothing but a pyroplastic flow channel situation all around the world, there's no way of knowing how many odd, you know, deposits of this, that, and the other thing could be along a certain area of agriculturally... I mean, principally, that's what they want to do, agriculture. Well, this is quite evident at our place. Yes. Because just below, there's a drop, and you can see one of these pyro... Plastic flow areas. Flow areas, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very exciting and interesting. Oh, this is interesting. So someone wants to give... Why don't you tell us? (laughs) I can't. I can't read. Hey, we have another Can person. Can you hear me? Yes, it's our friend, Sean oh, Dooley, and he is he's a mastermind behind all of the computer activity here at the radio <laughs> station right at this moment. But nevertheless, we have someone on the uh, horn, if you will, that's going to give some more information on this conference. Oh, thank you. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, it's so wonderful to be on the air. Hi, I'm Rachel. I work for the Nevada County Tech Connection, and I just wanted to let people know where they can register for this event. So um, the website is nctechconnection.org. And if you go under events, you'll see Ag Tech 19. And it's going to be February 7th from 2 to 5 at Sierra College at the Nevada County campus. Yay, team. Thank you. <laughs> for sure. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. So at least we're, we're on uh, base where we're at and where you're going to be at and Mm -hmm. some of the information you're going to be dealing with and i wish that someone from the audience would call in with a question 
I have a question. Yes. Are you going to bring like samples and uh, like a a drone or or something to show people? So we we are aerial based. Even though we started out as drones, we moved to airplanes. Um, so we contract our pilots out through wherever we fly across the country. And but we do when we're there. Um, you know, all we really need, I, I'm happy to show people what the imagery looks like from yeah. okay. looking at going on to your desktop or also, you know, just logging on to your app on the phone. OK. Um, a couple other things are if you go to series imaging dot net, you, uh-huh. can actually demo, you can actually demo the imagery on there, which is really cool. Good. So it's it's just www dot series. C E R E S imaging, I M A G I N G dot net. And you can just click on a button that says demo. Good. Great. Good. That's yeah. perfect. Yeah. So yeah. that gives people an idea at home what they might be able to do or think yeah. about in terms of any number of issues that they may be looking at. I do have to tell you, though, that I, I think that it's uh, w- this is wonderful information, but I want to mention that the Nevada County Resource Conservation District Office is an amazing resource for people to go to, no matter where they live. It turns out that they have gone people walking across the land of North America and done soil types and uh, for down to uh, very small (laughs) plots, even in remote areas. And this was done uh, because it was the U.S. uh, Geologic uh, Survey. And that really helps you. And you can actually, a person can, who say has two uh, acres or less, you know, can go into the office and they can say, gee, I live over here. Can you see some soil maps on this and what I have to deal with? And they can give you some ideas of uh, additions and subtractions that you might need to consider. Plus, then you go to the Ag Department, which is a wonderful resource, part of the University of California. And and, part of the federal government. And part of the federal government in any county. And the the county, yeah. Yeah, and all over the country, this is true. Right, right. And and they're all webbed together. So in some ways... And there's also the master gardener. And then if you're a local person and you want to know more about how to be in this area, we as uh, you as a master gardener, I yeah. was never so lucky to have the time yeah. to do this, but I can tell you that you become a master gardener, you become aware of all these resources that are there for you for nothing. The only reason I say this is that although this makes sense for the 20 acres, the 20,000 acres, that's fine. And maybe for five acres in a certain location, if you're really trying to turn yourself into a certain kind of a farm, I want to be a daffodil farm. Can I do it? You know, and maybe you can and maybe you can't. Yeah. You know, these are sort of things that you want to, you know, I have a dream of doing such can you do it there? Maybe, maybe not. So this is a way of understanding these kinds of things. But when you have committed farmers on 20 acres or, or more, more. Yeah. then you really have to refine this even more. And Other, you need the experts. I and mean, you need the experts. Uh, like people like you. Yes. And so at this kind of an, uh, presentation, people who have interest in agriculture of many different kinds, because let's face it, what is agriculture? It's trying to derive a living from something that is the resources of this area. Correct. And agricultural pursuits can, the sky's the limit. I'm sorry to say, and I'm grateful to say. Do you understand what I'm saying, Jenna? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, there there isn't a one-size-fits-all, right? Everyone's trying to do something different in agriculture. And so maybe maybe what we're doing is a good fit, and we hope it is. But Oh, I think you know, it sometimes, is. Sometimes, you know, drones work for some customers, and sometimes satellite imagery works for, you know, trying to map the entire globe and watch what's going on. So there's a – we call ourselves platform agnostic – um, because we'll go to whichever platform <laughs> works best. I like that. Uh, but, That's a great description. Yeah. But the other thing is, 
irregardless of whether you're a backyard gardener or somebody on one, two, five, ten, twenty, or more acres, I'm sure there's something for everybody at your presentation Absolutely. that would help them. Yeah. Am I yep, right? Yep. It, yes. I think there's. it looks like there's going to be quite a good breadth of technologies and um, resources and different different people from different walks of life that give different perspectives. So I think it's going to be, I'm really excited. I think it's going to be a great conference for, for any size grower to attend. Good. Good. Uh, the other thing that I think is really great about aerial surveillance, I don't know, it happened with me. I had a friend, he went up in an airplane, took pictures of our place. Right. And it just blows your mind. You're looking down Stuff you can't see when you're on the ground. Yeah. And and if you can look further, deeper into the ground, you can also see things that have been there a long time and that you're part of, but you didn't even think about. Correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yep. you know, it helps you to understand where you are. <laughs> and, and what you can grow. Right. And... Are you a gardener at all, Jenna? You know, I am, and my... Not to get off topic, but my my husband uh, does our gardening. He he puts all the plants in, um, so he installs it, and then I garden it. And Great. he was actually a Cal Fire firefighter up in the North San Juan area, so that's not too far away from you guys. Not at all. And we thank you and him for all the <laughs> things you do, because the whole question of forestry is a big one in the chart of California's history right now. And sure. especially as a wild firefighter, we honor all these people, men and women, who have uh, been there on the lines. And we're grateful to even the convict crews that come because we have the biggest convict crew in the world, California does. And we know why, but we also are grateful for everybody that helps in these emergency situations. And a lot of it has to do with how are you going to focus on this area are you just going to let it burn or are you going to learn how to harvest and or if you're harvesting what are you doing with that harvest are you going to use it to do something else is it building a house well, how are we going to handle forestry in the mountainous regions of california this is a big story and it goes all the way from baja california all the way north into Washington State and into Canada and up to Alaska. So the point of what I'm saying is our landscapes as we see them today are not necessarily the landscapes of yesteryear. No. Oh, no, definitely not. So, and, but one thing about firefighters is they are usually very good gardeners as well. So he right. uh, rotates quite a because they usually have... Uh, a lot of gardening, um, a lot of gardens going on at their stations uh, for their fresh food, for their the meals that they prepare. And so he put in a whole bunch of uh, red lettuce and spinach and kale and some Brussels sprouts. And we have some pineapple guava, if you Good know what that Good for you. Is. I do. I, my mother yeah. used to have them. Yeah, they're great. Oh, it's fabulous. Tell them yeah, not to so forget they... cilantro. It's oh, such it's an not... easy one. Never too late Please. now. We have cilantro in oh, the good. summer, and I wanted to put it in in the winter time, but he said it wasn't a winter. Uh, well, where? A what elevation is he at? Uh, we're in the we're in Ripon. We're in the Central Valley. Oh, because see, what I found, I used to live in Hopland. If I put my okay. cilantro in in the fall, it would last all the way into the spring. That was at eight or nine hundred feet over in uh, one one corridor. But I found that I could do it here too. And it's still growing and doing really good. Won't go to seed as fast because of the weather. And I got sure. it growing yeah. in my greenhouse at 4,300 feet. And yeah. the greenhouse hasn't got any heat in it. Takes out heavy metals, yeah. too. It's a good one to eat in your diet. Oh, a lot yeah. of people don't like it, but, you know, it's well, a really... a little bit, long, it's though. just like anything else. Yeah. A little bit is great. Yeah. Uh, uh, for us... Uh, Cilantro pesto isn't your favorite. No. Ooh, I love it. Yeah. yeah, see, now she wants it. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. but some yeah. people like the really strong taste. It's strong, yeah. I, I'm a garlic yeah. eater, too, so, you know. Yeah, well, I'm a garlic eater, I too. I are. love garlic, but, <laughs> you know, um, well, I can't help it. I'm Scandinavian. Scandahoovian. Huh? Scandahoovian. Yeah, I'm and a Dane to boot. So, <laughs> Me too. You know <laughs> that's what we these, have in common. I did when I grew up was in the Northwest, and we never had a Mexican restaurant. Now you I might. didn't know what a res- Mexican <laughs> restaurant was until I moved to California. Oh, I love California. So, that you know, way. <laughs> um, I grew up with. Um, Boiled potatoes, rutabagas, parsnips, turnips, cabbage, carrots. you know, and meat. And you better eat some carrots for your eyes. I carrots, oh yeah, <laughs> we had carrots, things like this, you know. Now uh, this is... Uh, but now, oh man, the wonderful food that can be had. Oh, I, yeah. I'm a real... Oh. F- I don't know, do you eat to live or do you live to eat? What's the... which is it? Oh, that's a, that's a good one, yeah. I don't know. I'm afraid of that. But nobody wants to call in and ask any kind of question about this. I just don't understand. (laughs) Well, I I welcome any questions, but if people are just kind of thinking about um, thinking about questions that haven't come to mind yet, I'm happy to talk to anyone at the conference. Um, February, what do I say? February 6th. That's right. And Sean will remind us. He's, yeah. he's ever present on this uh, uh, extreme uh, electrical charge thing called internet-ing or interrelating. <laughs> what is it, John? <laughs> the day of the event. Oops, sorry. February 7th. It's February 7th. February, February 7th at, at Sierra. Sierra College. In what room? Yeah. Um, at the Sierra College multi-purpose room from 1 to 6 p.m., so it's afternoon. And there's other presenters, and that yeah. can be found at that site uh, that we found. Do you remember, Sean? Yes, the site is nctechconnection.org. And when you looked at the picture, what you saw was this kind of hovercraft thing, and it's going mm. around looking at something yellow what kind of a plant looks that to you, Roger? I think I what it is it. is an oil crop, like uh, the beginning of uh, rapeseed, or maybe it was, uh, oh, I don't know, sunflowers or something seedy. That it's it, rape. It is rape, yeah. When I flew over the Czech Republic in the summer, they, they, they have a different climate than we do there in London. Yeah. They have to grow their rapeseed in uh, the summer, and so when you come into Prague, you see all these fields covered in yellow, and it's nothing but rapeseed. You know, originally, rapeseed oil was used uh, for technical oil uh, instead of uh, using those things like, uh, what do you call it, fossil fuels. And uh, even if you clean it up and it's petroleum jelly. But they used uh, rapeseed as a... Uh, industrial oil, but it has turned into an oil that is used in food. And then there's questions about it, and back and forth. We've been through a whole, what, 40 years of discussion on, what do they call it? Canola oil. Yeah. And then there were the lawsuits about having the uh, GMO crops and the, the neighbor got right. it next and door. safflower oil. Oh, and... my God. Yeah. yeah. Safflower oil. Now, that... You know the the uh, you know choosing a crop is a big other story, and and that has to do with the economics of uh, crop choices and stuff. You know, I don't know. The whole world of agriculture is just as uh, speculative, maybe more so than the stock market. I don't know because you're not sure about the weather, you're not sure about a lot of these things. But she's covering Jenna's covering an area that has to do with the actual resource of the area where you're trying to do your gardening or farming. or whatever. And I think it's a great idea. Me too. Yeah, Me I mean, too. a great project. Plus that... you're meeting other ag- agriculturists or people that are interested in this kind of thing. And uh, just sharing at those kind of conferences can be very beneficial uh, because it turns out you may have other interests besides uh, cilantro <laughs> and garlic. <laughs> 
You hey, know. don't knock the cilantro. I'm not, sweetie. You don't know. I've been hooked on <laughs> cilantro because it takes out heavy metals. And when you live in the Sierras, and frankly, if you live anywhere, you are subject to uh, forces beyond your ability to... Well, even our yourself. drinking water. Yeah, drinking water. It has heavy metals. It can, it. especially anywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then beyond that, you get into the air and what comes to you and is... Uh, rains down on you in the way of uh, particular... Well, still, we're, I'm sure we're still uh, suffering from acid rain exactly. from... Exactly. Uh, from everything. Well, uh, from the Japanese... Fukushima, uh, yeah, it's Fukushima, still coming in. Yeah. And the ocean itself and the weather above it this year has caused us to have this incredibly warm January. No, and, it's, it's February where, where it really will hit. Yeah, and I mean it's seventy degrees over a lot of the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, of the air quality. And I do know from last year, um, previous last year, I had two white peaches. Yeah, trees, and I would get a you know bushels of them. Yeah, and last year they were in full bloom, and then March came. And it and just it washed it away. Yeah. And snowed. And I lost my crop. Thank goodness the apples and pears um, did well. Did fine. Yeah. But my peaches um, and apricots, it was a total bust. Well, that's the thing about agriculture. If you got a lot of land, then you got to consider uh, different crops for different areas on the property. And then. How will they do from one year to another? Because you, like you were saying about the apples, last year was a good, a this last year was a good apple yeah. year, and this year probably won't be so good. Yeah. So then you've got to think about these things, and you have to keep all these things in your mind as you bumble along in the reality of life. Yeah. And Jenna, thank you for calling us. And giving us all the information, yes. and uh, I, I do hope that a lot of people show up at your conference. It Me should too, be fun. Yeah. Oh, it sounds fun. Yeah. Well, well, thank you, thank you both for having me on. I I enjoyed the uh, I enjoyed the questions, and I enjoyed the witty banter as well. It's always fun. Well, we have to have fun because that's all we have. <laughs> right now, anyway, at your conference, it'll be fun too, and we. Hope and you should have nice weather. So. Oh, you're going to have lovely weather. Yeah. I just yeah. know it. Even if it rains, it'll be fun. Oh yeah, either way. So you just keep on keeping on, and we will too. And Sean, do you have anything you want to thoughtfully provoke our minds with? Um, merely the information, you know, it's Nevada County Ag Tech 2019, February 7th, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. as part of the Sierra Harvest Annual Food and Farm Conference.